Welcome back to the Lucas Grobot Show. I'm Lucas Grobot, and this is where we uncover purpose, relentlessly pursue truth, and own the future. Today, we are in two, part two of an episode with Dr. Stephen Hicks, who wrote Explaining Postmodernism. And as I said in, in the first episode, it is, I really believe, a very important book to understand the, the meta narrative and, and the arc uh, the, the framework of what we're seeing happening in society today and really brings a, a, an understanding of, of the chess moves that's happening. So we're not just looking at the, the detail, but we're able to see the big picture. So if you haven't listened to the previous episode, go back and listen to that before finishing this. Dr. Stephen Hicks, this, this conversation has been so great. We just ended talking about uh, Botswana and Zimbabwe and how one adopted um, Marxist ideology, German Marxist ideology, and the other adopted, uh, just kept on with the British rule of law. Uh, 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 my question is, and this is a brief question, um, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on it, but isn't the, isn't the argument that, well, the the African people or the the Chinese or the Hong Kong people they could have gotten there on their own. We don't need your help. We didn't need your help. You just stole from us. Yeah. Well, uh, we can always say maybe. I, I say human beings are human beings everywhere, and I'm, you know, I'm open to the idea that yes, in fact, people can get there on their own. We we do know that in the United States, uh, 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 some people make. Choices. They're going to rise themselves or raise themselves out of poverty. Some people don't. Some people who were born into wealth decide to fritter it away. Some people decide to invest it and become even even wealthier. So yeah, there's nothing that holds back anybody in South America or or or, or sub-Saharan Africa or Southeast Asia from getting their act together and, and rising up and doing so. And there are lots of examples historically of cultures who uh, have done done uh, exactly that. Um, but I think it does seem to be fairly clear that in many cases, uh, cultures have improved because they uh, imported ideas mm. from and institutions from outside of themselves, or in some cases, they had ideas forced upon them, and that led them down a path that maybe initially they uh, grudgingly accepted those ideas, but then they did uh, uh, they did improve. So, so these, another I think example of this would be mm -hmm. you know, Japan after World War II. Now, it's true that in the century prior to World War II, Japan did make some steps toward modernizing itself. But it is true that the dominant culture in the lead up to World War II was militaristic, still highly feudal, still highly authoritarian, still highly hierarchical. And what had to happen was, you know, the Japanese lost the war and the Americans came in and basically said, you're not going to do any of that stuff anymore. You're going to have a democratic Republican institution. Mm -hmm. You're going to have open markets and we're going to get rid of feudalized feudalism. So it was at the point of the gun. But the Japanese uh, more or less grudgingly adopted those forced upon them institutions and then went on to become one of the world's great success stories. So there's no one path necessary. Mm. So uh, going back to Bots Botswana in, in Zimbabwe, you, you, you mentioned the word Marxism and radical Marxism. And, and mm. going back to the beginning of our conversation um, we were talking about objective truth. You, you're talking about advantage versus privilege. We're talking about um, leveling at homonyms um, and essentially playing with this rhetoric, saying that you know we are we are just a subdivision of the community that we are a part of. We're not individuals. Um, it, it just confuses me at what, if there has been, you know, like in Zimbabwe evidence that that doesn't turn out so well. Um, why today and, and what is the historical background of Marx? Because right, Marxism is the, the bourgeoisie versus the proletariat. How did that like, how does that have anything to do with um, what we're seeing today when we're talking about um, inequality or privilege or um, 
minorities or uh, taking care of the environment or equal rights for all animals, uh, how how does that even connect? And why do, why should we even be worried? I mean, these sound like really really great ideas, really great things. Yes, well, that's a a, a good psychological ex, uh, question. Uh, so, you know, I want to talk about Marxism in particular and neo-Marxism, and there's lots of subversions of Marxism, uh, so on. And Marxism is not the whole story. It's just a dominant part of the story, given the influence that it's had over the, the last uh, 170 years now. But what we do know is, uh, you know, about human psychology is that a lot of people are kind of semi-active intellectually but also uh, have a significant amount of laziness that when they are in their teen years and maturing and groping toward an identity and forming their mature views about the world, people will think about things uh, and they will come to adopt a worldview that seems to have a lot of answers. Mm. And by the time they finish with their formal schooling and start working and start forming a family, they stop thinking about those issues very deeply. So whatever worldview happens to have made an impression on their teenage wow. mind, that more or less is the one that they will stick with wow. for the rest of their lives. And it's not just political ideologies. We also know that this is true of religious ideologies. A lot of people they will be born into a religion. It kind of makes sense. It's got explanations for a large number of things, and they'll think about a certain number of things, but they really stop thinking seriously about religion by the time they get on with the rest so, of their lives. So the teenage years are, are super important for development and understanding ideas um, and setting a direction for their life. So that, that would point to a really big importance on the education system. Yes, yes, for sure. So the teen years, I'm sorry, you cut out for a moment. So forgive me if I missed part of what you just oh. what you just said. But yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah, teen years, particularly for beings like us, you know, we are big brained human, uh, a, a big brained species. And there's just an enormous amount that we have to learn, uh, you know, because we don't operate on on instinct or automatic behaviors the way most other animal species do. Um, so, you know, what happens in those teen years when our brains reach mature size and hopefully we're born in a comfortable enough circumstance where we can spend a lot of time absorbing lots of music and lots of movies and reading lots of books and having lots of conversations, that really is a decisive mm. decade. But the other thing I wanted to say on the on the psychology to go back to is it's, it's not to only and perhaps not even importantly, people uh, who stop thinking seriously by the time they are 20 or so is uh, people who become more intellectual. They become teachers and lawyers and journalists and professors and so forth. And another thing that we do know is that uh, people, when they come across a, a worldview, it seems to have a lot of explanations to them, and it has a normative component. It's got a, a sense of what's right and wrong about it and what's important and noble and beautiful. That Those things also push our buttons very deeply, and people make commitments mm. to a worldview with a normative component. And one thing that can happen is, and it happens unfortunately with a lot of people, is uh, people make a commitment to a worldview, and at that point, no matter what new evidence comes along and no matter what new arguments come along, they are never open to changing their minds about anything important in that worldview. And that's true of, of intellectuals. Now, partly this is you know, a matter of professional standing. So I might, you know, if I'm a young professor, write a book or two or some articles in my in my early 30s. You know, so I went and I got my PhD by the time I was in my late 20s. I'm establishing my career and I'm getting some books and articles out. But now my public reputation is tied to the positions that I took in those wow. books. Yeah. And for the rest of my career, it's a matter of protecting my babies, right, so to speak. And, and we really are like mothers protecting our, 
our babies. So the idea, and this is an enormous act of courage and intellectual re responsibility and honesty, if I am now in 45, I do a serious rethinking of my younger work, and I have read more data and counter arguments and so on for me to say, you know, I got some fundamental things wrong. I need to rethink everything through, mm. which is exactly what intellectuals should be doing. That's a very high bar and only few intellectuals will actually rise to it. So if you have a large number of intellectuals who young in their career are attracted to an ideology like Marxism, that's only one of many. Uh, uh, they will remain Marxist and just become more sophisticated in their elaborations and after the fact justifications of Mar the Marxist worldview for the rest of their careers. Now, do you see a difference between Marxism and, and socialism? Uh, Marxism is a species of socialism. Socialism is the broader label that says the social takes priority over the individual Everything should be collectively organized and collectively done. Marxism is one theory about the right way to do that. Okay. And so, you know, help me out here because I still don't necessarily see the issue. It's like, okay, people think that the collective should be prioritized. Um, what's, what's the harm in that? I mean, we have, we have the Nordic countries. We have, you know, Sweden. We have Norway. And these are always pointed to as great countries that are that are, you know, using socialism today, um, you know, and, yeah. and what's happening in America, you know, that seems like really great things. We're, we're focusing on um, gender. We're focusing on uh, minorities. Um, why is there why is there an issue? Uh, prioritizing the collective over the individual. Well, yeah, I do think uh, Sweden is a great country. Norway is a is a great country. But what made them great was not socialism. <laughs> what made uh, Sweden enormously wealthy over the course of the 20th century was that it was largely a free market liberal society that respected individuality a lot, let people create business, was open to world markets and engaged in democratic, uh, Republican political institutions, all of which are individualistic, right? Everybody gets a vote. Everybody can think for themselves. Everybody can participate in the pr process. And so you, in effect, have a free market of political ideas. And Sweden was largely free market in its uh, economic structure as well. As a result of that, Sweden became enormously wealthy. And then in the last couple of generations, because of the enormous amount of wealth it started to engage in a lot more redistribution. So it started to move in a more collectivist direction. Uh, you know, Norway is a similar situation, but Norway also had the, uh, the advantage of sitting on huge piles of oil. And uh, so it was able then to bring in a huge amount of wealth from the world markets. Uh, again, that's a product of capitalism, and it still had a culture that was largely individualistic. Do your own thing as a Norwegian with respect to your political ideas, your religious ideas, mm. and pursue your own thing. So it was largely an individualistic culture that became enormously wealthy and then could start to engage in large amounts of redistribution. Now, my view actually right now, and I'm not an expert on this, so to take this as an educated amateur view, is that right now Sweden is a more capitalist, more individualistic nation than the United States oh. is. On controls and on the amount of redistribution, there's more of that going on in the United States right now than in Sweden. But that would take a significant amount of uh, the social science to, uh, to sort it out. So yeah, right now in the United States, while the United States does have some very strong entrepreneurial, liberal capitalist roots, it also has a huge amount of, of, uh, of socialism, large pockets of, of socialism. My view is uh, if you go into the poorest neighborhoods in the United States, the reason why they are poor is precisely that those are socialist uh, enclaves within uh, a, a broader liberal democratic society. So if you look at the large percentage of people who live in the poorest of the poor neighborhoods, they, they live on welfare. They are wards of the state. They get government welfare checks. They all go to government-run schools. 
and they are forced to go to those schools. They're not allowed to send their kids to schools that might be two blocks away, but those blocks are in a different zoned district and they are not allowed to send their children to those schools. And in fact, mothers and fathers that try to do that are often arrested and what? fined right for doing so. So then those, isn't that an, uh, an in, argument for... In many for... cases, let me say one more yep. point in these enclaves, they're not allowed to start their own businesses. There are barriers to entry. If I want to start a barber shop or a daycare, I'm not allowed to do so uh, due to all kinds of regulations that are put upon me. So what you have is the opposite of any sort of free market capitalism keeping people poor. So isn't that the, the very argument that there is systematic racism and oppression going on in these communities? Um, well, it's, uh, it is systematic and there is, I think, a racial component, but it's not only in uh, um, those racial uh, groups, right? It's any poor group. Uh, and so there are white poor groups, there are brown poor groups, there are black poor groups and so forth. And in the poorer neighborhoods, they are subject to the, the same forces. And you're saying so, that this is coming from... Uh, but the- I do think there is a disproportionate element. And part of that is going to be due to the nature of the cultures that, that are involved. I do think each culture bears some responsibility for their, 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 their situation, but there also are, of course, racist elements that are contributing factors. And you're saying that this is a, is a byproduct in a system of the socialist left ideology, not of what's considered more um, the, the capitalistic right ideology. No, no, exactly right. So if you are, look, if you are in a situation <clears throat> and... <clears throat> Uh, we could talk about the drug war, which would be another aspect of this. But if you're in a situation where your parent or, or your parents uh, aren't working, but they are living on uh, a government check right, from welfare, well, then you are not being raised in a capitalist household. You are being raised in a socialist household. Because socialism says people receive their income from the state. If you are going to a school that is a government run school, not a private school, then you are in a part of the subculture that is socialism, because socialism says the government should be running the schools and children should be going to the schools. If you have lots of regulations that say you are not allowed to start a business because of this regulation, that regulation, some other regulation. Sometimes it's a zoning regulation. Sometimes it's an occupational licensing regulation. That Then you're living in a system where it's the government that's saying what work you can and cannot do. Mm. You're not a free market entrepreneur able to just start your own business. So on all of those counts, the actual best descriptor is that you are in a socialist sub economy or a subsystem right within a broader liberal democratic system. And that's why you're poor. Exactly. Because you were born into that dysfunctional socialist experiment within the United States. I mean, the people who are successful are the ones who get out of those neighborhoods and go elsewhere. I mean, I I know we're we're out of time and I want to be respectful of your time. So many things that I could ask you one about you know, Harvard trying to outlaw homeschooling, saying that they're brainwashing yes. people, uh, kids. Uh, I, I, I'd love to ask you about, um, y- you know, these these it's happening right now in America with widespread protest and um, even people rioting. It's, yeah. it's framed that it's rioting against, um, you know, yeah. these capitalistic systems that have I- enslaved them. But w- it sounds like that there has been such a strong a communication and narrative that's been leveled by the socialist left that they're like they're they flipped the script to say like actually your your oppression is not these socialistic systems we're actually ones helping you it's actually you know yes. this party over there yes no that's exactly right yeah the the flipping the script is uh, is good a, a, a good metaphor earlier you used the uh, the chess playing analogy that's also good there is strategy there it's not just ideological blinders there are other power 
control elements as well. So maybe what we should do is plan to have another conversation in uh, six months yes. or so. Yes. Yeah, the homeschooling issue, uh, you know, you're absolutely right. Uh, I think that's a disgusting, right? The, the professor at Harvard uh, uh, who is most associated with that, just a, just a terrible I'm argument uh, that she was making. Uh, but that, you know, I think is, is an example of you know, a certain kind of snobbish elitism and paternalism from person who is in a you know position of authority coming up exactly right with an ideology and a set of policy recommendations that is just going to devastate another uh, generation of, uh, of poor people. Because uh, she absolutely knows that the, the government schools in all of these poor neighborhoods are absolutely a disaster. Absolutely a disaster. It, there's just no excuse whatsoever for the state of those schools. And yet here we have people who are systematically opposed to school vouchers, charter schools, allowing uh, uh, private schools to come in, uh, allowing poor people in those neighborhoods to start their own entrepreneurial schools, allowing parents to take charge of their own education. They are opposed to every single possible remedy to getting those people out of poverty. You might say ideological ignorance and ideological blinders goes a large way, but I don't think that uh, explains the whole story. I think there's a huge moral failure on the part of these people to uh, to, uh, to look seriously at the data, look seriously at the alternatives. So that certainly could be a whole other conversation. So I have one last closing question and I'll let you go. You know, on CNN, Van Jones, uh, to paraphrase, um, said it's not the KKK that we need to be worried about, but it's the the Hillary Clinton liberal woman, and that you know that every white person has a virus inside their brain that can be activated at any time. And then you you also write in your book, and I believe it was Marcuse that that said this that liberating tolerance would mean tolerance of movements from the right, or it would mean intolerance of movements from the right and tolerance of movements from the left. And, and we mentioned flipping scripts. We've mentioned this, you know, this, this framework of chess playing and strategy. I mean, when I hear a statement like this, that, that is blatantly saying that my kids are racist just because they're white, that seems like a racist statement to make. But if anyone were to say that, I would be the racist. So wh why, like, is this, where does this rhetoric lead? And have we seen evidence of this rhetoric in the past? And what's, if this bears into fruition, where does it end up? Mm, yeah. Well, the racial issues are, are one, one set of issues, but, but you're right. Um, yeah, there are, are people who believe that everyone is a, is a racist. Um, and so, you know, that's a, a long legacy of, of human history, racial thinking, that again, only uh, liberal individualist and mostly capitalist countries have done a good job at countering in the, in the modern world. There's exactly a, a sexist version of it that all men are basically uh, by nature sexist pigs. Uh, uh, and so you, you have the exact same script running through on sexual Grounds. You have a you have a, a, a wealth version of it that anybody who's born into into money or economic advantage is by nature a bad person and and suspect, and that only virtue and dignity resides with uh, with people who are poor and and so forth. So uh, whether you're talking about economic issues or sex and gender issues or race issues, and of course there are other variations on it, it is the same general script. And I think, uh, you know, I'm a philosopher by training, so I think the important thing is to try to go up that one level of abstraction and to, to realize that there are issues about cognition. Can we, in fact, grasp facts or not, no matter what our skin color is, no matter what our, our gender is, so that we can have these discussions? Is it the case that uh, wealth is created? human nature or human identity and who I am is a self-creation or am I 
just a passive vehicle through which other forces uh, grow and so on. So those philosophical issues do need to be engaged. And it's from that perspective that all of the particular skirmishes that we're talking about, the right to uh, understanding of racism and sexism and poverty and post-colonial history and so forth, all of those skirmishes then uh, need to be uh, need to be engaged. The real battle is that philosophical battle, and we do have three or four major frameworks that are out that are there right now in our generation that are in in collision. So that's where the real fight is. Well, Doctor Stephen Hex, I you know this was just one of the the best conversations. Um, and I really appreciate you you taking the time to to speak to me and to my audience. Um, everyone, please get his book, Understand or Explaining Post Modernism. Uh, where can they find Where can they find you? How can they follow your work? Well, thanks for the uh, the plug of my my book, and it really was a, a fun conversation. Yeah, Explaining Postmodernism is uh, is available at Amazon and uh, all the usual places. And uh, there's quite a few translations that are out there, uh, including Arabic. I throw that one out there since I know you are in in Dubai. Uh, so it can be gotten in translation, and it's in the ebook form uh, as well. Uh, for people who are interested in following me and my work, I have my website, stephenhicks.org. And then I also do at uh, ThinkSpot, which is a new platform, live stream lectures two or three times a month. So stephenhicks.org or go to uh, ThinkSpot and get signed up there. Those are all possibilities. Wonderful. Thanks for having me on. Thank you so much for being here. It was a pleasure. For me too. Wow. That is all for our episode with Dr. Stephen Hicks. Please, I, I mean, when I read this book, um, my, my eyes were opened to the chess moves that I have been seen making in a new way, right? There are frameworks, there are strategies um, that are being played at, you know, much higher levels, much higher abstractions, as, as he said, that, you know, I think... I could kind of tell that something was going on. I could kind of put language to, but when I read his book, um, it it lays out um, really historically how these thoughts, how these ideas came to be and the line by line progression all the way into the how how uh, Marxism and the, the bourgeoisie versus the proletariat got flipped into it because they said, wait, wait a minute, Capitalism actually does work. We're not going to be able to establish our 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 utopia ideologies um, due to the failings of socialism in in the USSR and other places of China, um, everywhere that we've seen it happen. And and so they said, okay, we need to alter our language because clearly this isn't working. The the poor are just getting into the middle class and they're not protesting. They're just, you know, becoming wealthy. And, and so what they did was they said, okay, well, it's not about being rich and poor. It's about inequality. It's not about, you know, the, the ruling class and the working class. It's about, uh, minorities. And, and they, they began to deconstruct all this language. They began to deconstruct, um, everything that we hold true, um, that we can test, that we can know, empirical data, reason. And they said, it's no longer about reason, that reason doesn't exist, that, you know, you can't even perceive the world and any perception of the world isn't even true because it's just through your eyes, just through your senses. And how can you trust that? What's inside, what's outside? None of that is actually knowable. What is knowable? Well, well will is knowable. You know, if you're just driven by by will, what what else is knowable? Well, if you're passionate, if you're really passionate, and then they also said, you know, irrationality. And so instead of basing things on on reason, on empirical data, they they undermine all the language to say, well, we're not, you're not actually an individual, you were just a individual. And then they they actually write out and 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 Dr. Hicks writes about this in the book and it's stunning that someone actually would would write this onto paper and that there would be organizations uh today that are 
actively pushing this forward into society. But they they write that, you know, the the individual is just there to serve the state. And if the state determines that that individual individual is no longer needed, then they can be done be done away with because they're no longer serving. And that is what we saw in in the the socialistic uh, national socialism of Nazi Germany with millions of slave, uh, uh, millions of Jews being sent to the, the gas chamber. That is what we saw with the Guglogs in Russia, where they, they rounded up all the intellectuals. And then all those people who overthrew the intellectuals, they were later rounded up as well. And they just kept on coming for person after person and no one stood up and no one said anything. This is what we saw in, in, in the killing fields of Cambodia, where they took Anyone who was educated, anyone that had a degree, anyone who had a teacher, anyone that had glasses that could read, they took them in mass genocide. And this, this is what we see time and time and time and time and time again. And I think this is, it is so important to, to have a worldview, to be able to see the world clearly, to understand where do these frameworks lead us? What do these frameworks lend us to? To understand even, I mean, I was, you know, blown away when, when he was talking about how there are these enclaves in America that are operating on socialism, which is the welfare system. And that that is the thing that's actually uh, oppressing. That is the thing that is keeping minorities and poor people essentially under under the weight of you know owned and and wrapped into being a a member of the state and that the only way out of it is being blocked because of legislation rather than having a free open market of capitalism a free open market where people can dis disagree on ideas without there being leveled uh, uh attacks and ad hominems where we're the, the thing about capitalism is we're not looking at the color of your skin, but we, the, the market cares about what you can deliver and if you can solve a pain. And I believe that every person, every person is born with a unique creative ability to be able to do that. The unique creative ability to be able to solve issues. And it doesn't matter where you were born. It doesn't matter who your parents were. It doesn't matter what your, your generational race is that you, you as an individual have agency to affect change in your life. And it starts small. It starts by cleaning your room. And it, it starts by clearing the fog on things in your life. And, and I've, in the past week, I've gotten, I've had so many conversations, so much pushback on some of these things as well, you know, you're being you know, awfully insensitive. And my, my answer is like quite the opposite. It's quite the opposite. It's I'm, I'm, you know, when you see, when you see people talking about defunding the police and tearing down the, the police structure and the, the system that is in place to protect people and, and weaving these narratives saying that, well, they're actually just set up to enslave people. But then you look at the empirical data and it shows otherwise. My thought is, if you took away those systems, who's going to be hurt? Is Karen and Rick out there in suburbia going to be hurt? No, it's going to be the, 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 the poor in inner cities that are going to be hurt the most. That's who's going to be hurt. So if you want to talk about caring for people, I think these are important, important truths, important empirical data that we need to be talking about. We need to be talking about them. You know, and, and this is what, what Stephen Hicks writes about in, in the beginning of his book. He, what are the roots of all this? The roots of all this thought was that there was rationalism. And they said, well, I have beliefs that don't align with these rational ideas. So I'm going to do away with rationalism and I'm going to exalt my emotions. I'm going to go exalt my feelings. I'm going to exalt my experience rather than empirical, rational data. And when we do that, when we dismiss the truth for, for the sake of people's feelings, we only hurt their feelings. We only hurt their feelings. That's all we're going to do. 
I believe that we need to sit with people and be empathetic. I believe we need to mourn with those who mourn. I believe we need to, you know, you know, sit. We do need to do that. We do need to be empathetic. We do need to be loving. And, and that's the, the radical middle that I think we need to find ourselves in. And then, you know, we need to speak the truth in love. We need to love our emotions. We need to let people have emotions. We need to let people grieve. We need to have that, that emotional creativity. And then we need to embrace truth. And that is what we talk about here. We talk about embracing truth. We talk about pursuing truth. We talk about testing our ideas because as as, as Dr. Hicks pointed out of, with, with Botswana and Zimbabwe, they, they w both went, took different ideas and end up in drastically different places where today those in Zimbabwe, he said, are, have, are eight times more wealthy, eight times more wealthy than those in Zimbabwe. And when we begin to realize, and, and it's, it's shocking, you know, like you said, it's those that when you're in high school, it's when it was in those developmental years where you're sitting and you're thinking that that's when it's formed. And so maybe you're in your 20s, maybe you're in your 30s. I don't know where you are right now in life, but I, I'd like to say that it's not too late. It's not too late to begin to look over our epistemological belief systems, to look over the data points, to look over and say, okay, why do I believe this? What do I believe? Is this true? Okay, I'm going to test this idea and I'm going to see where it ends up in my life. I'm going to look at other people who have adopted these same ideologies, these same ideas, and see where it's ended them up in their life. And as Dr. Hicks said, you know, so, so many times intellectuals will write their manifestos, their PhDs, their, their books in their early 20s or late 20s or early 30s, and then they'll spend their life defending their books, defending their ideas, and they become calloused. They can become calcified rather than accepting new data, rather than realizing that I could have been wrong because that, you know, that's humble pie. I don't want to do that. I, I don't, you know, it's, 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 it's humbling to go back and be like, okay, maybe that, that idea definitely wasn't articulated right. Okay, that idea, I've, I've grown and matured. Even in, in my book, Anchor the Discipline to Stop Drifting, I, I look back on that book, which I wrote six years ago, five years ago, six years ago, and I say, hmm, I, I think I would say that a little differently. And that's embarrassing to do. But rather than merely standing by our ideas and refusing to grow, um, that is a bad way to live. And as Dr. Hicks said, there, there are some people who in their teens, they develop their worldview and then they continue on. And then there's some intellectuals who are playing chess and strategy at the highest level, making sure that their ideologies and indoctrinations are being placed into kids into teenagers, into children to shape and form the worldview that they want to bring about the, the, the systems and the, the quote unquote utopia that they um, have bought into. And it is, it is dangerous. It is dangerous. But guess what? You and I, we have agency in our life. We have agency in the world. It doesn't matter what country you were born in. It doesn't matter whether you're in North Korea or whether you're in France or whether you're in Jeddah or Riyadh. It, it doesn't matter whether you're in Dubai or New York City. You have individual agency. You are a powerful individual that can make choices for your life no matter what system you're in. No matter what system you're in. You know, when I was in North Korea, it was one of the, the darkest the, the most oppressive place that I have ever, have ever been. But without a doubt, there are people there who are choosing to have agency with their life, to take control over what they can control and make their, their worlds a beautiful and lovely place. And that's important. It's important to remember that there is beauty and that there is truth in the world around us. There is beauty and there is truth in you as an individual, as your friend, as your family, as your neighbor. There is beauty 
in that individual, whoever they are, whatever their creed, whatever their race, whatever their gender, whatever their age. And that is something that is worthy to focus our attention on. It's something that is worthy to put our, set our minds on, on noble things and things that are good and pleasing and beautiful. That is worthy to put our meditation on and to give our lives to. Thank you so much for being with me. Please, please get his book. I don't think I've, I've I, for sure not within the last couple of years, read a book that I, I feel is so good. I've been, I've been telling every person that I've been texting with, I've been saying, you have to read this book. You have to read this book. You have to read this book. And I really hope that you go out and get the book. There's translations in Arabic. There's translations in many different languages. It is an excellent book. I, I got the, the book on Audible um, to, to listen to. And it, it's actually quite short. It's only like seven hours to listen to. And it's entertaining. It's educational. It's story-driven. And it just, it, it, it opened up so many things that I, 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 I didn't know and so many things I, I it was able to connect the dots. That is all for this two-part episode with Dr. Hicks. I am so glad that you choose to spend your time here. It means so much to me. If you have any questions, I would love to answer them. You can WhatsApp me at plus one two zero two nine two two zero two two zero, and I will answer your question. I'll even answer your question right here on the show. That is all. Please tell your friends, message this, share these two episodes with your friends to help them see and help them have a framework by which they can more clearly see and understand what is going on in the world today. I'm Lucas Scrobot. You are a change maker. Go out and pursue truth, pursue truth and own the future.